Hallelujah. It's Resurrection Day. Happy Easter, everyone. It is wonderful to have everybody here in person and several of us online. Um, Easter Sunday, the 31st of March, 2024, here at St. John's uh, Presbyterian in, in Toronto. We always give this extra bit of information because people watch us online later who might not know. I'm the Reverend Maureen Walter, the minister of the church. We have with us this morning, as well as our uh, music director, uh, Mrs. Grace Hahn, our choir, including Lucia, who has not been here in quite a while, so we're thrilled to have her back. We have several guest musicians with us this morning. Matthias Mores on trumpet. We have a, a, a soloist we haven't met before, uh, Eric Yang, who's a baritone, who's a U of T music uh, student, and Emma, who's uh, been with us for a while. And so we are expecting to have a wonderful uh, Easter Sunday celebration. Thank you, everyone. For thousands of years, this land has been the traditional home of the Huron Wendat the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. It's still home to indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We're grateful to work, live, and worship on this land. And uh, Julie Gangadine, one of our session members, will help us with our call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin. Lord, we praise you. The cross is vacant and the tomb is empty. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Praise the Lord. Let, Let us, us worship, worship God. God. Our hymn is number 249, The Day of Resurrection.
Let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, through the rising of your Son from the grave, you broke the power of death and condemned death itself to die. As we celebrate the great triumph, may we also make your resurrection the model for our living. Help us to identify in our lives those things which we have had to let die so that your resurrection might take place within our soul. Help us to allow ourselves to release those things which no longer serve us, old habits, old patterns, things that keep us tied to a, an existence that is apathetic and not so full of love and help us to replace it with your life which abounds in love and justice, compassion, kindness, and mercy. Keep us alive in faith, hope, and love as surely as you raise Jesus Christ from the grave let us know that we also live today with you and forever in eternity. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And be assured that in the love and mercy of God, we are a forgiven people. This day is a new day, a fresh start for each one of us. Amen. We're going to read responsively from Psalm 118, verses 1 to 4 and verses 14 to 29, which I think is the first stanza in the last. Psalm 118, and Julie's going to help us with the responses again. thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, God's steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, God's steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, God's steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might, and has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord, that's fine. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live, and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success.
Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, who has risen us light. Bind the festal procession with branches, up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good for God's steadfast love endures forever. Isabel Spears, one of our members, will read our, uh, some of our lessons to us. The first lesson is from Isaiah 25, verses 6 to 9, and it's on page 738 in the Pew Bible. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear and he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is your God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Okay. Uh, the second reading is from Acts 10, verses 34 to 43, and it's on page 1152 in the Pew Bibles. When Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Our final reading this morning is John 20, 1 to 18. The Resurrection of Jesus. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken my Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. 
They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated beside Jesus' body where it had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned towards him and cried in Arabic, Raboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of the Lord. Our hymn is number 251, Christ is Alive.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Amen. Early on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb where the body of Jesus is buried. She stood at the cross while Jesus died. Now, at the first possible moment after his burial, she goes to his graveside. However, when Mary arrives at the tomb, it has been opened. Mary runs to get Simon Peter and the disciples whom Jesus loved. She needs to tell them Jesus' body is gone and she does not know where it is. The three of them rush back to the grave. In fact, the other two run past Mary in their haste to get there as fast as they can. One looks in, the other goes right in, and just as she has told them, Jesus is not there. All that remains are the cloths that Jesus had been wrapped in. The puzzled disciples return home, leaving Mary standing there by the empty doorway crying. Mary bends down to look one more time into the tomb and sees two angels sitting there. They ask why she's crying. And she replies, it is because they have taken Jesus away and she does not know where they have laid him. She turns away, still crying, and notices the gardener standing in front of her. She asks him if he knows where Jesus' body is and assures him she'll take charge of it and bury it carefully. Instead, the gardener says her name, Mary. Suddenly, she knows who she is talking to. Oh, Rabuna, teacher, she gasps. Do not hold on to me, Jesus tells her, for I am not yet ascended to my father. He tells her to go tell the other disciples. I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So Mary finds the disciples and tells them, I have seen the Lord. When Mary was that first morning of the week, she had no plans at all besides somehow getting through her first full day of loss. Instead, she became the first person to proclaim the resurrection. When we get up on Easter Sunday morning, we get up expecting to celebrate the resurrection. We gather to rejoice in the promise of eternal life. There's a difference between us and Mary. We have heard the proclamation of the resurrection before. We expect it. So we plan for the party. We buy extra food. We invite friends and family to join us. We know we're going to be rejoicing. Mary at that time had no such knowledge. We think we know the good news, but sometimes we are not as ready to hear it as we expected to be. No matter how many times we have heard the story, resurrection remains a shocking idea. It's not just surprising, it's challenging. 
Resurrection is not always an easy concept to consider. I learned in my early years of ministry that people must mourn the death of their loved one before they can grasp the resurrection. After a few times when I was puzzled that my words were not well received, I realized the idea of resurrection cannot be the first thing to say in the presence of death. A long time ago, an 11-year-old boy, grandson of dear friends of the family, who I'd watched grow up, was killed in a car accident. I went to the funeral. I grieved deeply for that boy. He was just an ordinary boy. I would have given anything to have him back unharmed. The funeral, while wonderful, was exhausting. I walked out with an older colleague. The boy's family were full of Presbyterian clergy, so there were lots and lots of ministers there. The colleague shrugged as I walked down the hall with him and said, well, in my decades of ministry, I've come to believe that God calls people home for a reason. At that moment, I thought that was the coldest thing I'd ever heard. Though it was clear he thought he was offering comfort, it was not at all helpful. Before we grasp resurrection, first the reality of loss must be acknowledged and even honored. Only then can people begin to think of God's promises about life beyond death. We all need to have any grievous loss that we have suffered acknowledged. Only then can we begin to find our hope in the resurrection. The idea of resurrection in itself is not all comfort. Mary sees Jesus is alive and she rejoices, but she cannot hold on to him. Her life is changed. She's joyful to see the Lord, but she and the other disciples still need to come to terms with how they will live without his physical presence with them. Nevertheless, despite our grief when anyone we love dies, Resurrection changes everything. Once we feel the loss, hope and peace can begin to seep into our souls. When we know death is not the end of the story, we even become open to joy. Years ago, a very, very dear friend of our family died. Marion Douglas, for those who knew her. She'd become part of our family, like an aunt to my father, and she was beloved by all of us, not just in our family, but throughout the congregation I grew up with. When my father had died, Marion had grieved deeply and long, and now 20 years after that, well into her 90s, it was Marion's turn to depart this world. At the lunch after the funeral, all of us who loved her remembered the many ways that she had affected our lives. We mourned her. She was an important part of many people's lives. Suddenly, one of her great nephews looked at me and he grinned from ear to ear. Can't you just see your dad welcoming her at the door and bringing her into the party, he asked me. And we all, every one of us standing there, saw that vision. We could picture what a joyful reunion that would be. Suddenly, our group of sad and grieving mourners were laughing together, full of joy and hope. The promise of resurrection had grasped us, every one of us, 
all in that moment. We all felt it. It lightened our grief. And it gave us hope that someday each of us would enter into that great celebration of life with them. Resurrection means there is more to come, some of which we can only imagine. We are separated for now, but not forever. The knowledge of the eternal and eternal life does not come to us all at once, but seeps into us gradually. We do not begin with rejoicing. First we mourn what we have lost. Then the resurrection becomes meaningful to us who have heard the gospel. I often remember another dear friend, Allison, as she and Mom and I sat and visited one day not too long before Allison died. We laughed together that day. Looking back, I know I heard the angels singing. Over the years since then, the memory of those lovely moments, drenched in laughter and love, have lifted my spirits many times. I only have to recall that moment to feel full of happiness and joy. Now I imagine them all at the party, and it makes me happy. I imagine my father, with all the dogs we ever had, playing with them in a glorious meadow. Once, a friend lost her dog, and she was heartbroken. I told her about my father, who was watching over my dogs. And I told her I was certain that dad would gladly look after her dog too until they were reunited. It's a fanciful image, just a little thought that is in my mind, imaginary. But the idea gives me hope in sad moments. That picture helps me trust there is a world beyond this one in which we will find healing. We catch glimpses in our mind's eye from time to time that hints to us of what is to come. It might be a golden light shining, or a butterfly in motion, or a loved one's face in a dream. They remind us of God's promise of change. In prayer, we sense God's presence binding us together. These glimpses teach us the reality of the resurrection. Christ died and was buried, and after three days, Christ was raised from the dead. Death is conquered forever. Life triumphs. We live with God in this life, and we will live with God in the next life as well. The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. We'll receive our offering.
We thank you, O God, for all our gifts, particularly this gift of life. We embrace it. We share our joy together as your body. We turn back this portion of what we have, that your hope, light, and joy might spread through all the world. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Well, thank you everyone for being here. It is wonderful to be celebrating Easter together. Thank you for coming. And I'm especially delighted, as I mentioned at the start, that we have some special guest musicians with us today. It sure adds dramatically to our service. And thank you so much. It, wow, it's wonderful. Makes it feel like Easter. Uh, and as you see in your bulletins, we have Matthias and Eric uh, that we have, uh, are meeting today for the first time, but hopefully maybe we'll see them again. We will have our coffee hour after church this morning. Uh, for anybody who's here and doesn't know, we have coffee. I think it's behind me. You might think it's in front of you, but on the other side of the organ, you can get out through either door and everybody is welcome. Uh, so we hope everybody will stay and enjoy a fellowship time together with us. Uh, we also have coming up on Tuesday our lunch bunch meeting uh, at 11.30 a.m. That's the 2nd of April. We bring a bag lunch and we sit around and chat and we have a lot of fun and everybody is welcome to join us at that. And then on Thursdays we continue uh, the Wellness Energy Healing Group that has started a few weeks ago. It's a free group. It's from 10 till 12.30. We suggest uh, that you um, email uh, to make an appointment because uh, people will work with you individually and they just try to get that into time slots. But that is a non-invasive uh, technique based on Chinese uh, uh, medicine that seems to be helping people gradually feel better over time, and people have very much been enjoying it. It's also very similar to meditation and other forms of quiet uh, prayer that we do, so uh, it's just a wonderful thing. Uh, and thank you, everybody, who continues to uh, support the congregation financially. We are deeply appreciative uh, we are, as you've noticed, collecting um, uh, the offering again through the church for a couple of years. We just didn't want to have any contact we didn't need to have. Uh, but you can also, because of that, uh, make arrangements with our treasurer to either um, join a pre-authorized remittance of funds or electronic transfer, if you wish. Um, coming up, and I have... Tuesday, April 3rd is the session meeting, but in fact, it's the 9th. That's just a typo completely on my part. There will be a session meeting. That went out in the email. It's not printed in the bulletin. And uh, communion will be coming in a couple of weeks on the 14th of April. So we hope to uh, have a, uh, everybody here, if possible, to join in communion or those who join us online at home to be prepared to uh, with their elements to join us at home. Those are all of the announcements I have at the moment, unless anybody can think of anything I'm forgetting or missing. So we will continue our service in prayer. 
Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks that you have brought us together as your body of Christ, that we are your people, your children, your church, that your Holy Spirit fills us and inspires us, that we might serve your purpose of love and justice and mercy. And we give you thanks that we have found our way to you. And we remember that all people are your children, made in your image, your creation, and that you love and care for us just as you love and care for them. We pray that we would be with each other to be a help and a support in every way that we need it. We pray that we might work together for good and that we might use our talents and gifts to serve you and to serve our world. And we pray again that you would fill us with your gift of the Holy Spirit, that our hearts might be set on fire with love for you, that we would feel the reality of your resurrection your promise of eternal life, your gift of a fulfilling and blessed life here and now, and that we would find all those opportunities that are given to us to serve others and to live a life fulfilling to our deepest needs of soul and mind, body, and heart. We pray that in this day of resurrection, we might find ourselves filled with the mind of Christ, that we might find the vision to discern your purpose for us, that we might know that we are needed, valued, and loved. Help us to discard any feelings of humiliation and shame. Help us to know that you have replaced those with your love, and that you truly value us as we are. And we pray that you would keep us faithful through all our lives in your service, and that when we see the chief shepherd face to face, we may see your glory and find that crown that never fades. We pray for all those who suffer harm, warfare, terrorism, bias, oppression. Help us to be the light that shines on the side of goodness and truth. Blessed be God for all his goodness. Blessed be God's Son, Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, the Holy Spirit endowing your body with the fullness of grace and giving to us, to everyone, the words of life eternal. Thank you for your bread of heaven. Thank you for your shepherding the flock of God. Thank you for your love for us. Help us to be that candle that shines in the dark corner that all might feel your warmth and love. And we continue to pray as we have been taught, saying, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 243, Jesus Christ is Risen Today.
Jesus. And remember that Christ died for you, Christ rose for you, Christ lives in power for you, that we might have life. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of us now and forevermore. Man.